Today, we're going to continue the, our, delf, our dive into uh, the, the probabilistic interpretation of deep learning. This is sort of part two of the lecture that we did on Monday. So um, as always, quick feedback. You uh, really liked last Monday's lecture. That was, I think, the best feedback so far. Everyone thought pretty much that the speed was good, which is a new thing. And most of you really like um, the, the quality as well. And even 17 of you actually responded, which is a, maybe the best sign. Um, and I think we're sort of working on the quality. We're moving a little bit in this direction. Uh, sorry, on the difficulty of the exercises. It seems like we're moving in the right direction. Detailed feedback. Um, quite a few of you liked the like, both positive things. There was actually very little uh, negative stuff to, to say. Um, Two people asked whether I could upload the lecture recordings. There was also a question on the forum and on YouTube. So I was inundated with requests to upload the videos. I did. I uploaded them yesterday. And now, of course, the next thing that happens is that people on YouTube ask me to upload the slides. I, it will take a bit of time to do that, but uh, I will even make this public at some point. Um, uploading stuff on YouTube is just an unbelievably slow process because the, 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 the user interface of YouTube is absolute garbage. So. Um, the code part was very fast. Today, I'm basically just going to talk about code. Um, I only have like five slides that are very easy to go through. Let's see if that works. Um, someone asked, how do I know whether a problem is good for GPs or not? I will probably talk about this more, but maybe the, go the goal of today actually is to get both of them connected to each other. So the goal, your, your thought process should maybe not be, should I use a GP or a deep network, but actually, how can I build a, a solution that combines the best of all of these worlds? And then the final question is, which is actually good that someone asks, is why do you prefer checks over PyTorch or TensorFlow? And the, the answer is, I don't know. I, um, I'll, I'll tell you sort of, a I'll let you into a little secret. A lot of people in my age who teach don't actually write programs anymore. Um, maybe you've noticed that some of my colleagues don't actually show you code. Um, and that's not in any way a, a sort of necessarily a bad thing, because as you get older, it's just hard to keep up, and it will happen to you as well. Um, and so I can tell you that I, over the course of my like, life as a researcher, I have written code in very, very early on MATLAB. And then during my PhD, I wrote code in, in Python, in Java, in a weird language called F Sharp that is a dial dialect of, uh, of um, ML or OCaml, um, which I got to work on because I was at Microsoft. And then uh, when I returned to a postdoc life, I, someone actually got me annoyingly hooked on MATLAB again for a few years. So it, it, I got really stuck with that. It, it seems really weird, of course, to you from the, today's perspective that people in the machine learning community like to work in MATLAB. But you have to keep in mind that during that time, there was pretty much no infrastructure in Python. Like matplotlib was still a new thing. It was not well documented. The interface was absolute garbage. NumPy was a new thing. It wasn't good to use. So it wasn't that exciting, actually, to write in Python. So people liked MATLAB because it had all these nice interfaces that made things really easy. Um, of course, today is very different. At some point, I went back to Python and got used to that again. And now uh, we've been through this absolute sort of roller coaster of deep learning toolboxes. There used to be things like Kaffee. Who still rem remembers Kaffee? Has anyone ever written code in Kaffee? There's like two people in the room. Then there was TensorFlow, PyTorch. Uh, now there is JAX. And there are new things, of course. There's all, all these other sort of things hanging off of that tree, like MXNet and so on. Um, and it's very difficult to be well-versed in all of them. And actually, I think if you, if you ask people who write code commonly for machine learning, if they are honest to you, they probably won't be. But if they are honest, they probably only know one of these frameworks pretty well. And so it's very difficult. It's a very sort of complicated question to ask someone, why do you prefer one over the other? Because they typically don't even know the other one. I've actually tried this with my PhD students as well. So they, uh, they asked me, why do you do the course in JAX now? Well, the honest answer is because when I was preparing the course, I decided to learn one of these frameworks. And I just got stuck with JAX because it seemed like the newest kid in town. And so I can give you an idea of what I think the differences are. 
But to be honest, they are probably not exactly precise because I don't know so much about the other side. So, and I've spoken with various people about this, and they seem to confirm, but it's not really clear. So I think a very high-level picture is that PyTorch is a more mature um, platform at the moment. It's maybe a bit more monolithic. There is one sort of deep learning, the one, one, one way to do deep learning commonly in, in, uh, in PyTorch, which is both good and bad. And JAX is more modular, it's still evolving, and there's a lot of different ways to do one thing. So JAX is a bit more maybe focused on you write your code the way you want it to, and then it's supposed to work. Um, you, of course, seen in the exercises that you've done so far that that, that isn't entirely true. You have to be really careful with um, manipulating arrays. Um, but it's more sort of on the, sort of the, the modular structure of the code. You write individual functions that are hopefully um, don't have side effects, and then you can sort of do auto diff very, very uh, directly through all of this, while in PyTorch, there tend to be these sort of modules. And a downside of that, actually, is that in JAX, there is, at the moment at least, at the time of here today doing this lecture, probably at least five different modules that claim to be the JAX deep learning module. There's something called Stax, and something called Flax, and something called Optax, and there are various other ones. Um, and they all have very different styles of defining a model. So I'm not using any of them. I'm writing sort of plain JAX. And maybe what's most important for me to say is what, you sh what the goal of this course in particular is, this is not the deep learning class. This is the probabilistic machine learning class, is to think about the structure of these models, what we're building. And then it's sometimes useful to write these small pieces of toy code, because then we can play with stuff and do computations directly even though we do them in a way that you would probably not implement them if you were build a really large model. So I have to say that at the beginning of this lecture, because today is going to be all about that. So yes, we are currently working with absolute toy problems. Today I'm again going to show you a two-dimensional binary classification data set, two moons, with a really tiny deep neural network. And the reason I do it with these simple models is that, again, this is the probabilistic machine learning class. It's supposed to be a relatively theoretical course where you understand structure in the models. And we're supposed to do live coding here in, you know, like a few minutes of train time. So I couldn't possibly do this with a model that would take three days to train, right? I can't, especially on a laptop, right? There's, there's no GPU. Well, it's not really a GPU that I can use at the moment in here. And uh, also, you know, you want to see answers within a few seconds. So this is not me trying to dump things down. It's trying to make it feasible. And of course, in practice, if you really work on a large-scale problem, you will typically have a bunch of GPUs, and then you will wait for a few days for them to train. But then it's useful to have first done these kind of simple problems that we are discussing here so that you have a feeling for what's actually happening. And then there's the deep learning class and other advanced courses where you can learn how to build these bigger models. With that, let's come back to Monday. I have introduced my, again, theoretically motivated abstract formalism for what deep learning is. I've sort of ex abstracted away the, uh, the, all the complexities of different types of deep neural networks um, and said, what we are going to discuss is the setting in which we're trying to learn a function that maps from inputs to some outputs, and we need to talk about the outputs in a moment, um, which are real valued, and which are parameterized by a bunch of parameters that we call weights and biases, for lack of a better name. And then we train these functions, so we find solutions that fit the data well by minimizing a regularized empirical risk function. So this involves a data set of inputs and outputs, supervised machine learning, x, i, y, i, n of those. We're going to, um, for each datum, evaluate a, an, an individual loss function, which typically involves transforming f again to compute some um, loss to the, to the training output, and it potentially also a regularizer that only depends on the weights. And now on Monday, we, just, we sort of reminded ourselves and made it very clear that this setting is in 
all but the most like, exotic cases equivalent to maximizing a posterior probability density function. Because the typical choices people make for regularizers amount to some log priors over the weight space, for typically a Gaussian prior, because the lost r tends to be a quadratic function. And this big term, this chunk here in front, um, corresponds to the negative logarithm of a product over individual likelihood terms, p of y given x and theta. And the typical choices of loss functions people make, for example, for classification, cross entropy amounts to a multinomial or binomial probability distribution for the labels given f. And the sum here amounts to the assumption, which is actually quite questionable, that the data are independent of each other when conditioned on the value of the weights. And that's just a common choice people make. And then we spoke about how to do this. So now I'm going to flip to code. And just to try to remind you a little bit how we did this, we ran this piece of code that I'm now going to run again. Um, and we saw sort of, first of all, on the sort of coding side, that this amounts to typically writing down, is this too small, by the way? Can you all read this in the back? Should I increase the font size? No? Larger? Better? Better now? OK, good. Um, so uh, this sort of tends to look like this. You write down some kind of model. Uh, and then we spoke about this predict function, which is a way to predict stuff in the future. And we realized that it's a bit maybe awkward that we separate into predict and empirical risk, because they are actually sort of very closely related to each other. And um, I need to make sure I actually ex execute all these cells. Then we initialize these networks um, using um, uh, uh, a bunch of random numbers to create initial weights. And actually, doing this right is a bit of a, like for large scale problems, this is a bit of a tricky thing, actually. Um, but for our simple problem, it's not so, it's not, not really a problem. It's just it's usually going to work unless we totally like, mess things up. So we choose a particular scale in which to initialize the weights. And one question you could actually have if you're following along this code quite well is whether this here amounts, like whether this shouldn't actually be chosen to relate somehow to the regularizer on the empirical risk. Because if the regularizer on the empirical risk is our prior for the weights, then maybe we should draw the initialization of the weights from the prior. But actually, people don't, don't tend to do this. It's just not the standard, standard way to initialize neural networks. And it's an interesting question why they don't. And I don't claim to know the answer. Now we initialize the network. You've seen this before. I make a data set, just so that you see it again. Um, by the way, I've changed the, the uh, if you notice, I've changed the, the architecture a little bit. So there used to be a 128, 64 times 1 in here, which would still work for today, but um, it, makes the, it makes some of the computations we're going to do in a moment a little bit slow, and then we'll have to wait for too long. So I like, made it a bit um, smaller. Um, now we've initialized the, the, the net. We see that it makes some initial prediction, which is sort of structurally looks like it might work, but it's, um, uh, of course, in no way fitted to the data, which it couldn't be because we haven't trained yet. We do this now by defining the terms that make up the equation that was on the slide just now, the empirical risk and the regularizer, that sum of those two is the loss. And I actually switch off the regularizer in this case, um, which is also a common thing that people do, at least for small networks. And then, we construct this sort of the algorithmic setup. We build something that you might call a data loader, a data stream, which in this case is trivial because it's just 128 data points. Um, then we initialize an optimizer, in this case SGD, stochastic gradient descent. But you could use pretty much all the other optimizers that are in this library, like Adam and Adam W and Godmos, whatever you like, and RMS prop, and they all are going to perform pretty much equally well on this problem because it's so small. Um, and then we describe how like, this kind of update step that the optimizer will go through. And you learn about these optimizers either in your math for machine learning class or in an optimization class. If you haven't yet, next term there will be an optimization course 
by uh, Professor Hein, and he'll go into all the depths you could possibly want to go into. Then we run this thing, it learns, and it again achieves 100% training accuracy. So um, we can make a plot, see that we go down to zero, accuracy goes up, and the prediction looks like this, which is both pleasing and a bit worrying. That's where we get to the sort of the end of, of Monday, which in the sense that this is clearly where the data is, a meaningful output of this network. It predicts the green class where there is green data and the red class where there is red data. But beyond the data set, when you start thinking about it, maybe this is not entirely pleasing because this network is very, very confident about these classes outside of the data, data region. And if you've ever heard about robustness and adversarial robustness, then you might be worried that you know, if, now, if you now have a test point that lies here, maybe this network shouldn't be so confident in the class label because um, you know, who knows what the right answer should be up there. Yes? Is this a problem for all discriminative classifiers or, or only for this one? It's not generally a problem for all discriminative classifiers. It's a problem with this model class. So um, we're going to talk more about this next Monday when I'll, I'll, I'll list individual pathologies of deep learning. But the short answer now is this is a VLU network. If you go back to the architecture that we've defined, sorry that I hop around in the code. Um, where is the model? Would be nice if it were sort of easy to hop around in this. Here, I'm using VLUs as activation functions. So everyone knows what a VLU function is, right? Yeah, lots of nodding. So it's these functions, right? That are zero and then they become linear. So something that is zero and then becomes linear um, will have to look a little bit like this. So we're moving these features around that in one direction have to go off towards plus or minus infinity. So they have this non-local structure. You can't locally put something without sort of adding some stuff in the far distance. And that's what we sort of see here. And we'll talk, about, talk more about this on Monday. The way to solve, quote unquote, this problem would be to use non-linearities that localize. So in the early days of deep learning, one common non-linearity was the Gaussian one. You remember the square exponential kernel and how we constructed it with these little egg or bell-shaped features. People used to use those as well in deep learning. But the problem, so th those have the nice property that they go back to zero. So as you go far away from the data, you'll just get zero back. So if you push it through the logistic link function, it's one half. So it's very uncertain outside of the data. The downside of these features is that they are very difficult to use in high dimensional spaces. So here's a two dimensional space and it's easy to tile a two dimensional space with a bunch of little blobs. But if you want to tile a higher dimensional space, let's say a 768 dimensional space, if you catch the meme, then it, um, you need to put a lot of these individual little ball-shaped Gaussian things into this space to cover it. Exponentially many, actually, in the size, in the dimensionality of the, of the problem. And that's why people stopped using these radial basis functions features, these Gaussian-shaped features, and instead use these let's say, sort of non-stationary ones, like VLU and TANH. Good. So this is where we were on Monday. And now what I want to do with you today is to talk about a framework to turn any such model, pretty much any, there'll be a tiny little constraint, but maybe you'll catch it as we go through, into a Gaussian process. But before I get to do that, there's a question. Yes. Yeah. So the, so the first half of your question is a nice lead into what we're going to do. The problem with this setup is that we're looking at a point prediction. An individual, a single function that this thing predicts. Now the question is, could we maybe hack some uncertainty in by adding a function that measures how far away we are from the data? Another feature that somehow uses the training data and says how far we are from the training data. And it, annoyingly, sort of the answer will have to be kind of, and we will do a little bit like this on Monday, but it's a very, um, 
sort of simplistic answer because, or a simplistic way to, that this would be a simplistic way to address this because then you would have to describe what you mean by being far away from the data. And that's sort of actually fundamentally the problem with, with generative modeling. If you want to generate more data, you have to say in which sense your data points are close to each other and what a new data point being far away from the training data might mean. And you can do this in a sort of very ad hoc way, and we'll do it on Monday, so I'm not going to tell you how now, but that will be very crude in its description of the data set. And you can use this to, do, to fix some crude problems, like, for example, this very extreme uncertainty here, far, or lack of uncertainty far away from the data, but it won't fix more structured problems like the ones that lead to adversarial irrobustness, for example. So I said, today, we're going to turn any deep neural network into a Gaussian process. And the way I'm going to present this process to you is thanks to many people over the years. Most of all, this guy on the right, Pierre Simon, the Marquis de Laplace, well, actually, that's not him. That's how stable diffusion imagines Frank Miller, the guy who wrote Sin City and uh, 300, would like, draw a super, superhero version of Laplace. So he's very energetic because he's saving the world. But they're also, like, so, so he came up with this Laplace approximation that by now, of course, you know and hopefully love because we've talked about it a lot. Um, in deep learning, this idea has em emerged pretty much early on when deep learning wasn't even a thing yet, when it was just called neural networks, um, through works by, among others, David Mackay. Jan Lecun also had a paper around pretty much the same time with pretty much the same idea. Um, and then more recently, there are various people who have worked in this direction. And I can just cite a few, but I'm absolutely missing a few more. So there is uh, M.T. Khan uh, from, uh, from uh, Japan. Uh, who published about this in 2019. In my own group, there was Agustinus Christiadi and also Runa Eschenhagen, who worked on many of these like, ways of making use of, of Laplace approximations. And I'll tell you a little bit about this uh, unashamedly on Monday. Um, uh, there's also people like Alex Immer and um, Eric Daxberger, who are PhD students in Switzerland and Cambridge, who did some of this work in the, over the recent few years. And various others, actually, including uh, Hippolyte Ritter and uh, David Barber and various others. So this is an idea that is sort of re-emerging. It was lost for a few years, since 1998 probably, for about 20 years, and now it's back. And that's why we're talking about it today. But it's not the only way to turn a deep neural network into a probabilistic model. There are various other ones. And maybe I have time at some point to highlight a few of the other ones very briefly. This is the one that I like most because it's the most direct one, the most structured one, in which we can look at what's going on and which is easiest to use. It's not the most precise one, but we'll see, maybe, that it's not so important to be very precise. So my main goal is not to get perfect uncertainty, but to take this stupid point estimate, this individual one estimate of what the true function might be, and enrich it with some uncertainty as functionality, with some, something that tells us more about what's going on in the network. And that is, of course, going to be a Laplace approximation. So raise your hand if by now you have a rough idea of what a Laplace approximation is. If you haven't, then you haven't been paying attention. That's good, so everyone thinks. OK, so that means we can do it on one slide. Here is how you turn your deep network into a Gaussian process. You start by doing what we did on Monday which isn't actually a, a, a code process, it's just a mental process. You realize that this regularized empirical risk that you have been training your neural network with is actually a negative log posterior. So when we train the deep neural network, we are minimizing a negative log posterior, which is the same as maximizing a log posterior or maximizing a posterior because the logarithm is a monotonic transformation. So that is maybe, like, this, it, you don't have to write any code to do this, but it's the most important step. Because once you realize this, everything afterwards can be, it's just you know, playing around with code. And 
we're really going to take this interpretation seriously, but that doesn't mean that we're going to believe that this is a perfect posterior. It's just, this is what people do. When they train deep networks, they maximize an a posteriori probability. Whether they believe that to be a probability or not is actually not so important. It's really what they do. Now, we go out, step two, and we train the deep network as usual. By as usual, I mean you do, for example, what I just did in this toy problem. I just ran the code, and now we have this thing. That's the step that we did so far. So now we are at step two. And now we're going to do two things that lead us to a Gaussian process. The first step is going to lead us to a Gaussian distribution on the weights and biases of the network, the parameters. And the second step will give us a Gaussian process distribution on the output space of the function f, the deep network. Right, so there are two things here, the weights and biases of the network. These are it's basically a collection of numbers. You could think of it as a big vector with structure. And then there is the prediction of the function f at any input x. That's a function of inputs. So these two things we need to connect with each other. I'm going to do, going to do that. So we'll first do the bit about the weights by doing the Laplace approximation, which by now we've done so often that I can just run, write one line. So at the trained point, so once we found theta star, we can do a Taylor expansion of the loss around theta star. So the loss is in particular also a function of the parameters of the network. And we're going to do a Taylor expansion. So a Taylor expansion means that there is a constant term, loss of theta star. Then there is a linear term, which would be theta minus theta star times gradient of the loss. And if we are actually at a mode, then the gradient is zero. So that term we can ignore. And I'll sort of wave my hands around here and just say we can, right? Now, we might come back to this a little bit later today and think about whether it's actually true or not. And then the second order term is 1 half times the second derivative times the quadratic polynomial. So in the case of multivariate uh, functions, that's a quadratic form. So it's the parameters minus the, the trained parameters transpose times the Hessian, up here it's defined, the, um, ah, this minus shouldn't be there. I think that's a typo. So let's just think of the Hessian. So psi is the Hessian, the, the matrix of second derivatives of the loss, uh, the, the log posterior, which is equal to the loss function, with respect to the parameters, with respect to theta. And then we realize that if we approximate the log loss in this way, that's, um, that means the log, negative log posterior is a quadratic function, and therefore the posterior is a Gaussian distribution. A Gaussian distribution with a normalization constant that we can compute in closed form, but for the moment we ignore it. And then there's a minus, one half times, and to get the minus we have to put a minus in here, that's why the minus is here. Um, a quadratic form, and to interpret this as a Gaussian distribution, we need to interpret psi inverse, with a minus in front, as the covariance of this Gaussian. And the inverse is going to be our big bane, because we'll need to actually somehow construct it, or some matrix decomposition. So this is where linear algebra comes in. Um, okay, now we have a Gaussian distribution on the weights. And let me see if I can actually just do that now. Um, yeah, I can. And then there's a line here which you can ignore for the moment. We'll come back to it afterwards. So here is the operative part of this. It's one line. I'm going to construct the Hessian of the loss with respect to the weights and biases, which we call the parameters of the network. Maybe I've got a big bug in my code. We'll just see. Oops, final. Mm, nah. Let's see what happens. Um, at the entire training data. So just to make sure what happens here, 
loss is a function of parameters and um, training data, inputs and outputs. And we're evaluating its Hessian with respect to the first parameter, the zeroth one, this one, rather than with respect to the data. And that's it. And you just saw it happen. I'll let it run again. Actually, I'll comment out this line so you see how long this one runs. Boop. Done. OK, that was the cost of this. Now, um, this goes so fast because it's a small network. So for a really big uh, deep learning architecture, for like a large language model, of course, we wouldn't even be able to just do this. Because what are we talking about here? A matrix of size, number of weights by number of weights. It's quadratic in the weight space. So if your model has 125 billion parameters, then we're not going to be able to construct that matrix, not even with the largest computers and memory banks that we have available at the moment. But for today, we can do that because it allows us to really look into what we would like to do. And then we may need to think about what you would do with a large model. OK, um, and um, yeah, so we'll, we'll come back to that object. But now we have it. So we have this psi which is going to be important for our uh, distribution on the weights. And now here's the final part. To get from the distribution on the weight space to an, a prediction on the function space, what we do is we take this, this uh, deep neural network F, which is a function of two things, of the input x and the parameters theta, and we linearize it again in the weights around the trained weights. And this bit is a bit confusing, so I'll go slow, even though it's just one line. So we take this function f, and we will write it locally as f of x and theta is roughly f of x and theta star, the trained weights, plus, well, how does a, what, does a what does a tail of expansion look like? Keep in mind that f is a multivariate function, potentially. So if you're doing classification, then f, or if you do a classification over c classes, then f will have c outputs, one for each class. So there isn't really a gradient as much as a Jacobian. So a matrix, a rectangular matrix of derivatives of the ith output of the function with respect to the jth parameter. So it's a rectangular thing. If we do c classes and we have d weights, then it's a matrix of size c by d for each x. So this thing is itself a function of x, of the input. That's where array-centric programming comes in, right? There's lots and lots of degrees of freedom. So if we do a Taylor expansion, we get a constant term plus this linear term, which is this Jacobian multiplied from the left onto the vector of parameters minus the trained parameters. So first, some things to note. This looks like a very strong simplification, right? We've taken this complicated function f, and we've turned it into a linear function in the weights. But it's actually more than what we had so far. Because so far, we only had f of x and theta star. What is that? That's the trained neural network. So this little blue thing, which seems like a constant floating and floating around, that is your trained deep neural network. It's the whole thing. It's a function of x. Right? This f is a function value thing, where you plug in an input, and then it produces a prediction. We've already used that and only that so far. So all of the plots you've seen so far are just this little blue thing. And it might seem like an afterthought, but that's actually your trained deep neural network. It's just a nice way of encapsulating all these complexity into like, you know, four, char four characters. Or three, or I don't know, five, six. And now we do something additional. We linearize it, so we add this Jacobian, which is another function of x and theta star. So it's like we add a whole new thing to our description of the problem. Actually, it's not an entirely new thing because it's a derivative of f, right? So it's not like it's a completely separate function. But of course, a derivative is also not the same as a function, right? It's, they are related to each other, but they are also separate. And then we multiply with the weights. OK, so this is actually what I do in this second line. This here is, say, 
I would like to construct the Jacobian in reverse mode. Ignore that for a moment. I'll say something about that on, Tuesday, on next Thursday. The Jacobian of the predict function. The predict function is that thing that we talked about on Monday, which is you know, a little bit like the empirical risk, which is the take the um, And I also, again, I need to make sure this actually works. Maybe I've got a bug in my code. Well, we'll see. With respect to um, the, ah, OK, so this doesn't really matter because we're not going to use it anyway. OK, fine, doesn't matter. Um, so we're going, we're going to use this, at, we're going to redefine that line a little bit later down in the code. It's just here to our clarity to have them both next to each other. Um, and we take the derivative with respect to, again, the parameters. Yeah? And that should work. Uh, good. And uh, now we have this object. And now we can do a little bit of math again and think about what we actually have here. So this is a fa that this way of writing f with the, the blue and the green bit, the trained net and its Jacobian, that is now actually a linear function in the weights and the parameters. Right? There's just times theta in there. And we've just constructed a Gaussian distribution on the parameter theta. And we know from these you know, laborious eight or so lectures on Gaussian processes that if you have a Gaussian distribution on a random variable, then any linear map of that Gaussian random variable is also a Gaussian random variable. And that's exactly what we have here. We have something, something that is a, a linear function of a Gaussian random variable. So that means this, this, when, we, when we marginalize out the weights, when we integrate out this probability distribution or probability measure or actually density function even against um, over the weights, then what we get is a Gaussian valued object, but that object is actually a function, so therefore the distribution is a Gaussian process rather than just a Gaussian distribution. So here we sort of now our notation also comes in handy. We don't have to think so much about this. This object f, as a, in terms of its input x, when we integrate out our belief over the weights, is now a Gaussian process. And Gaussian processes have two um, uh, describing characteristics, two parameters, two sets of sufficient statistics. What are they? A mean function and a covariance function. And the mean function now is, well, it's the expected value of this under this distribution. So the, under this distribution, the expected value of theta is theta star. So the expected term here is zero. And we're just left with this. So the mean function of our Gaussian process is going to be the trained neural network. And that's good, because it means we've just found a place where to put our trained deep neural network into our construction of a probabilistic belief set. Right? It's in the mean. It's the prediction we're going to make is the one that the deep neural network would make. And then, what's the covariance matrix? Well, so the, if you have, let me you know, remind you, I should probably have put this on the slide, but then it would have been a bit full. If you have a, if some random variable is Gaussian distributed, this chalk is too small, like this, then any affine map of Z is also Gaussian distributed. with this mean and this covariance, standard property of Gaussians. And here, where the, where the mouse arrow is, we have such an object. So our your j is a, essentially. And that means the covariance function of this Gaussian process, the kernel, is going to be minus and then an inner product around the inverse Hessian with the Jacobian on the left and right side. And I will call this the Laplace tangent kernel. 
as the covariance function. And this isn't really like an accepted name. Actually, there is no name for this thing in the literature yet, um, because it's a pretty new sort of idea still floating around. So the people who write the papers on this, they all have a different name for it. Like people have, you know, it depends a bit. Every, depending on which set of authors writes the, writes the text, they use different names for it. Um, OK, so that's it. That's what we're going to do. And I will do it in code. And I just briefly, maybe to anticipate your, your question, already quickly um, sort of review again what we're going to do. So we're going to construct this Gaussian process. And in the end, I really want to have something where I can call our Gaussian process library on and make it a Gaussian process. And we'll do that by defining the mean function of this Gaussian process as the trained deep neural network and defining the kernel to be this thing, the Laplace tangent kernel. So we already have this. That's easy. I can already write down the mean function. Now we just need to write this thing in code, and that will take us a few lines of code to do. Um, and what, what are they? Well, so they need to do sort of two things. The first thing is to construct the Hessian. I've essentially already done that in this line, where I just call this H. But um, uh, of course, now we're going to need the inverse of this. So we'll need to do some matrix decomposition. We need to think about how to do this. Your sort of, maybe your knee-jerk reaction is to use Cholesky. We'll get back to that. Um, and then at test time, so when someone later you know, wants to do something with this Gaussian process, we need to be able to evaluate this Jacobian function additionally. So that means if someone gives you the, uh, a new input, what you now do is you used to do just the blue thing. So you just evaluate the trained network at the, this test point. And now we're going to do two things. We'll do the forward pass through the network to evaluate f, and then a backward pass back down to get the Jacobian and use that to get uncertainty. And that sounds like a feasible thing to do. If it sounds like a feasible thing to do, then that's good. Because that's actually the power of this entire approach, which I'm going to pitch to you before we take a break. The nice thing about this is that this is really something you can apply to pretty much any deep neural network. Of course, if it's a large network, you have to think a little bit about how to do it right in code. It's not going to just work out of the box. But it's not something that completely breaks with the sort of paradigm of deep learning. If you are a, someone who comes in from a deep learning perspective, like you know, if you, for example, have taken a deep learning class in last term, then you get to keep these trained neural networks that you've just worked on. In fact, you don't even have to retrain them. You don't have to change the, you don't, not only can you keep the architecture, you also can keep the trained weights. So if you've just fiddled with SGD or Adam for weeks to get it to work, or if your company has just invested $120 million to train your large language model, you get to keep that thing. You don't have to retrain it. That's very valuable because there are other approaches to probabilistic deep learning, Bayesian deep learning, which do not have this property. So for example, there are approaches using Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling methods, which require that you retrain the network multiple times to construct what's called an ensemble. So you have to, so if you think about how expensive it is to train a large language model once, just imagine what if you had to do it 50 times. So we're not going to do that. We're just going to keep the network. And you get to keep however you trained it. We, in fact, we don't even care. We construct the approximation that makes the kernel after the training part. In fact, if someone is so kind to give you an open sourced solution, a trained neural network with the training data, because we need to be able to evaluate the Hessian of the loss, then we can do this post hoc. And we've done this in my group sometimes. We've taken pre-trained image net models and just added a Laplace approximation afterwards without retraining it, which is kind of nice. And the only thing we need to be able to do is to apply autodiff and linear algebra. So do these construct additional constraints on, on, on our deep learning setup? No, because you're already doing autodiff anyway. If you can't differentiate through your network, how are you training it? Right? So that's, they're, they're only the most exotic deep learning models are not trained with autodiff. Some, I don't know, crazy evolutionary algorithms or whatever. But if you're honest, those probably don't work anyway. So everyone is training with, with, with backprop. So you already have your Jacobian. So you can do that. And then the rest is linear algebra. Yeah, 
And of course, you know, linear algebra, hmm, we need to think about it, but it's something you can actually think about. It's not just, ah, I've got 50 samples lying around, let's think about what we can do with them. It's this very rich object that has been studied for hundreds of years. But the result is an actual Gaussian process. And by the end of this lecture, we will have it in our Gaussian process language. It has all the functionality that a Gaussian process has. You can sample from it. You can uh, project it onto other variables. You can even train with new data by calling the condition function that we have in our library. You can, you can evaluate its log PDF, its evidence, and so on and so on. The downside, of course, is that we'll have to live with is that we'll need to compute a Hessian decomposition. And I'll do that with you just now after the break. And you will quickly realize that the way we do it today, which is the pedestrian, like the direct way, is not going to scale to large scale problems. So when you have a large network, you will really have to think about how to do it right. And at this point in 2023, you still have to do that thinking. I wouldn't be surprised if in 2027 you don't have to anymore because some smart model takes care of it for you because that's how linear algebra works. It gets abstracted away. But right now, we'll still have to do it for ourselves. And then there's this other thing that usually comes up at this point that people then draw a picture and I've had conversations like, so two weeks ago I was in Oberwolfach and I had a conversation with um, various big old deep learning people about this with, who had sort of had been primed to do the following argument. Ah, but you know, what does Laplace do? It takes the posterior, which is this complicated thing, <laughs> looks like this maybe, and then it just finds this mode and then it just do the, does this Gaussian approximation to it, that seems really dangerous, right? Because it's just this local thing, and it only evaluates the Hessian here. What if your model is really, like, you know, there's all this mass over here. Maybe your true model, model looks like this, right? How do you know, how do you, like, this doesn't really help much, right? Now, this is true, and this is actually a weakness of Laplace. But let's keep in mind, that nobody knows what this thing is anyway. What currently happens in the real world is people compute this. And now we're adding something to it. And it, this is really important, so I'm trying, I really want to make this point. The goal today is just to enrich the language of the current state of the art in deep learning. It's not to give the perfect mathematical answer to all problems you could possibly have. Because these objects, these full posteriors, if you like, they are fundamentally very hard to track because they are non-linear, non-convex pro optimization problems. So there's really no good algorithmic handle on, on describing them. And we'll just need to find some approximations to it. There are other algorithmic approaches that try to enrich this language. So if you were taking this class, I don't know, in New York City, you might hear about a very different way of constructing these approximations and you would get good arguments for why they might be better because they maybe have stronger mathematical guarantees, but they also tend to be harder to use in practice and more expensive. So there's of course a trade-off between a simple approximation and a very good one that is very expensive. I'm trying to construct the one that you can actually apply to pretty much any neural network. And with this, um, let's take a break. And then do the actual code in five minutes at 9 or 10. No, 9, 9 10. So now um, I want to use the entire remainder of, this, of today's lecture to just show you code. So I'm, I've gone back to the code I've seen, shown you before. Here, um, here's this one line that is actually important and which did have a bug. So also the thing you find on Ilias has the same bug. I evaluated the Hessian not on the trained network, but on some other parameters that were floating around somewhere. And actually, I recommend that you run this code with the bug because it gives an interesting Hessian to look at that might be interesting to, to study. Yes? Can you explain a bit how uh, it would look like to evaluate a Hessian on the entire training set? So we have to huh. like this is a good, good point. Do I have, I have a slide about this also next uh, Monday, I think. But pretty much, OK, let me draw a picture. Uh, but also show you a, an equation to it so that we have lots and lots of different layers of stuff again. So keep in mind that the loss function, the empirical risk, is a sum over all these terms. So this function, L, depends on, well, let's say two things, the data, x and y pairs, and the parameters, theta. So in your, ah, I've drawn the picture already, I think, at a past, at a past point. 
So in your head, you have this uh, tiny. Um, you can think of an object for the for the hash for, for the gradient for the gradient of the loss. So lambda l. You can think of an object that is of size d, where d is the number of parameters of the of the loss, times n. That's the number of training points. And inside of your machine, this whole thing gets evaluated. And each of these contains the derivative of the loss of training point n f x n theta with respect to d theta d. Right? And then we have d and n in here. And then afterwards, your computer, without telling you about it, sums over this bit. And now we have a vector. Actually, of course, it doesn't sum over the whole thing, and it doesn't build the whole thing, because we are working on batches. So actually, we're just taking individual slices through this thing at some point. That's our batch, batch of size 3, and then just sum those three. And then we randomly pick some of those out. That's linear algebra, right? And now if you have a Hessian, it's sort of the same thing. It's just now an array of three dimensions. So there is sort of a, it's some kind of uh, blocky thing, right? Um, of size d by d by n. And we sum out the n. Well, that's it. So let's build this thing. It's this one line here. Actually, I'll comment this out because we really don't need it. It's just so that we have it in the same, in the same cell. I should say, I wrote this code hectically over the last few days. I've changed it this morning already. So there's bugs in there. It's just, you know, that's how close we are to the, to the, the state of the art. And now here comes our main problem. We're going to need to do linear algebra on this object H. What is the shape of H? Well, I just told you, right? It's size d by d. Uh huh. Let me check that this is actually true. Oops, where did I type it? <laughs> I'm not in the wrong right cell. Huh? It doesn't have a shape? What's that? What's that? Why, what, what's the error? Oh, it's a list? Uh, mm, uh. Okay, what does H look like? Oh, okay. So here's the nasty part. Because of the way we described our code, let's think again about what the parameters actually are. So we initialize the parameters as, where is it? Uh, the parameter function, right? We make this list. And the list is of length, number of layers of the network. And for each layer, there is a pair, weights and biases. And then each of these weights and biases, that's an array. So here's the bit where I need to think about how long we're going to talk about this, because it's both the tricky part, but also the boring part. So let me. Like, use a few more minutes. Actually, I'll wipe this out here briefly. Because this is going to be the one where it kind of your, your head hurts. So we need to translate from this sort of array view on, that is convenient to write these functions this, uh, this uh, you know, initialization function and the architecture of the network, which is kind of what people like about deep learning, right? So that you're able to write these sort of metaphorical neural networks with cells and layers, which are more sort of easier to describe in these kind of, I don't know, pie tree like structures. And translate it into a, into a matrix on which you can do linear algebra. So theta is actually a list which contains layers 
right? So the layer goes from 1 to, I don't know, L. And then in each layer, there is a weight and a bias. So it's either sort of weight or bias. And then once we're in there, each of these, either it's a weight or a bias, is an array. So if it's a weight, then it's a matrix of size number of units in the layer below times number of units in the layer above. So then it'll have indices i, j. Or actually, it has indices. <laughs> it's not good to draw on a wet board. Let's be a little bit more precise, because we're actually quite general in the structure, right? so the inputs might be multidimensional. It has indices shape of layer below times layer above, if you know what I'm trying to write. Right? It's maybe not a particularly clean. This wouldn't work in Python, but it's kind of what I'm trying to say. Right? Um, but that's only true if it's a weight. If it's a bias, then it's of size number of units in the layer above. Then it's a vector, if you like. So the other way, it would be shape of layer plus, comma, somehow. So what we would like to have is to unravel this whole thing into a matrix. And we're just going to need to do that. And uh, when I realized that I had to do that, I thought, OK, I'm going to do that tomorrow. And then I put it off for a bit. And in the end, so I uh, sat down with Marvin again to make sure I don't mess it up, because it's really difficult, actually, to do right. So let, let me show you how we do it. And then I will say, of course, this is one way to do it, but it's not the, so here, right? We can, OK, I'll, I'll just leave it out. Um, and of course, there might be others. This one works. And if you have a nicer one, tell, tell us about it. So first of all, um, we, this, we construct one of these. Python has these enum structures, integer enum in this case, because it's a discrete thing, so that we are able to say we have either a weight or a bias. So this thing here is either 0 or 1. And if it's 0, then we call it weight. And if it's 1, then we call it bias. Then we can index a little bit nicer. And now um, sort of we can look at this thing, look what it looks like. Right? So the Hessian at layer i for the bias, that's in this indexes into the row of the Hessian. That's now something of size. Let me actually run it. <laughs> um, yeah. So let's go back up the definition of the, of the parameter, of, of, the, of the architecture here. So I've decided that this network should be of size 2 input layer times 64 at comma 64, 64, 1. So it's a deep neural network that has one, two, three sets of weights mapping from the inputs to the first layer, to the second layer, to the output layer. And the output layer is one-dimensional because it's binary classification. Um, and uh, so, OK, so um, this means the Hessian, this hopping around, of course, is bad here. So the Hessian is a matrix that contains second derivatives of one of the parameters. That's the first three entries. Um, no, the first two ent entries with respect to some other parameter. So on this layer, the biases have a Hessian, so an inverse covariance, with respect to those on the other layer, let's say the weights, that look like this. So this is of size number of units in layer i, then nothing because it's a bias, and then number of units in the weights of the number of elements in the weights of layer j. So that's a matrix of size 64 by 64 in this case. 
And I encourage you to play around with this code to convince yourself of this data type, because you might not need to do it in the exercises anyway next week. And it's a bit of a pain to go through. It's just, you know, once we build arrays, we just have to do it. So now I don't want to spend too much more time on this. What we actually do is we build a stupid little for loop, which is not good in Python, but it's just the way we're going to do it to unravel those parameters. And it's one of these for loops that when you see it on a, on a screen, won't tell you much. You just have to kind of write it down yourself. So I'm, I, I'm providing it to you. And I'll briefly tell you what it is. And then we'll just have to stop it there and look at more interesting stuff. So what we do is we go through each, we initialize some empty lists, blocks and sizes. Blocks is the operative part. Sizes is some bookkeeping. And now we go through all the layers. In each layer, we swap between parameters and weights. Uh, sorry, biases and weights. It's just a binary thing. And then we create something which we collect the row of the Hessian at layer i and um, parameter bias and weights. And then append the, um, uh, sorry, that's, that, that's for the sizes. That's just to keep book so that we know how large this thing is, which is store how large that part of the matrix is. And then, then we go for the other side of the Hessian. So the Hessian is a you know, second derivative with one with respect to the other. So the first two for loops are for one, and the other two for loops are for the other. Uh, again, we go through all of the layers and all of the types, biases and weights, and append the entries that are in this list of tuples reshaped into the size that they should have so that they fit into a row. And you can imagine that the first time you write this down, it doesn't work, and then you have to stare at it and find all the stupid bugs, and then it works at some point. So I can run this now, and you see it's very fast, actually. And in the end, we, now, we have now a list of all these blocks, and we just collate them into what Jack's NumPy calls a block matrix. And I'm also collecting the cumulative sum over the sizes. Those are then indices in this big new matrix that tell us where one layer ends and uh, another one starts. And now I can make a picture of this object. It looks like this. That's ah, because I've zoomed in, so you can't really see it. Let me zoom out a little bit. So here's our Hessian. Um, and I'm plotting so that you can see something, I'm plotting the, um, the log base 10, so the, the, the decimal logarithm of the absolute values in the Hessian. So in the Hessian, there are positive and negative numbers, even if it's positive definite, of course. So I want to take a logarithm, otherwise you can't see anything, and uh, then take the absolute value, and it looks like this. And maybe you can just barely see some blue lines that I've put in here and there. Those are these boundaries between different parts of the network. So up here in this tiny little block, remember that our, our, our network is of size, I'll write it down here again, 2 times 64, 64, 1. So at the beginning, we have a weight matrix that mediates between 2 and 64. So it's of size 128 by 128. That's this tiny little block up there. Then we have biases, which are just 64. So they are next to it. And they have their own covariance, uh, inverse covariance, which is this little block. And the inverse covariance of the lowest layer weights is this little block. Then we have a 64 times 64 layer. That's a lot of things, 64 squared weights. That's why they make up the bulk of the session. It's this huge part in here. Um, and then we have the output layer, which is one dimensional. So there's something, there's one, matrix, one weight matrix of size 64 times 1. That's down here. And then one matrix of one bias set, which is also 64 times 1, because it's just a bias. So that's down here. And that's our Hessian. And you can stare at this for quite some time. And maybe, you know, think about what this structure tells you. And actually, like, in fact, this, these plots, they look very different when you change the architecture. So I encourage you to play with this code, change the architecture a bit, maybe remove one layer, 
maybe make one a little smaller or larger, and you will get very, very different pictures. So what you can think of, what you see here, this looks a little bit like a computer chip, right? And actually, this is maybe a good metaphor, because what you see here is some kind of occupancy map of your memory in your neural network. So one way to think about these objects is that if you invert this matrix, then you get a covariance matrix between the weights. Right? That's our psi inside of the Laplace approximation, the psi inverse. And then the diagonals of this matrix will give you a marginal error bar on that weight. So if the numbers there are small, that means the data constrains these elements strongly. It's like your network knows something about this bit. It's using the memory at that point to store something about the data. And if the number there is very small, it means the network has not used this weight yet. The error bar is very large. The data has not constrained the weight yet. And the off-diagonal terms tell you something about how things relate to each other. So remember, you had actually a homework exercise at some point to think about precision and covariance matrices of Gaussians. This is a precision matrix of a Gaussian. Can someone tell me what a white entry means? So this is roughly zero. What does a zero on the off-diagonal of a precision matrix mean? Yes, when conditioned on the other numbers, those weights are independent. And a zero in the inverse would mean these things are just independent marginally. So there really is an interpretation to it. And I want to get this across. It's not just oh, there's a big numbers right, floating around. You can actually look at this and like, think about it. And now what, we, what we'll need to do is to invert this matrix. Now, of course, so far for Gaussian distributions, we've done this with Cholesky. But there is a few problems with applying the Cholesky decomposition to this matrix. The first one is that no one guarantees us that this matrix is actually positive definite. Why? Well, first of all, it's a non-convex optimization problem. So the Hessian might well be non, uh, in, indefinite. And then we've trained it with an optimizer that has maybe found a minimum but it's stochastic gradient descent, so it's not like we know for sure we are absolutely at a minimum. So we just stopped it at some point, right? We didn't run it until convergence. We just stopped it because we thought it had converged. So there might be some negative curvature in this matrix. And so what we should probably do is to do either a singular value decomposition or an eigenvalue decomposition. Because this is a symmetric, so Hessians are symmetric, right? Um, and then, uh, eigenvalues and sim singular values are closely related to each other through a square. So the most general description is an eigenvalue decomposition, um, which I'm going to do so that we can look at these things. So this is this line. I'm going to run it. That's the one bit that takes a bit of time because this is a 5,000 by 5,000 matrix, roughly. So we need to take an eigenvalue decomposition of that. That is not cheap, but now we've done it. And this has constructed for us, by the way, so this is Jack's numpy's Linalg method for the eigenvalue decomposition of a Hermitian matrix, because this matrix is symmetric, so it's in particular also Hermitian. Yes? Uh, the last matrix that we work with usually has many of them, uh, continuous in the parameters? The loss functions, the little l, tends to be continuous in the parameters. So it's only then that it's continuous. Yes. Actually, they're, they're continuous, they're pretty much always. I don't know if a loss function is not continuous. I know of loss functions that aren't differentiable, like the hinge loss, but continuous, yes. And now, um, okay, so I've run this, and now we can make a plot. So what I'm going to do is I will plot, um, again, the, uh, the eigenvalues. So first, I'll take the log base 10 um, uh, uh, eigenvalues. We'll take the absolute value of the eigenvalues and then plot their uh, logarithm. And so this function, h, it returns conveniently the eigenvalues sorted by their size. Um, so it starts with the smallest and goes to the largest. Usually we wanted the other way around. We want the large eigenvalues first. So that's why I reverse the indexing here. So that we go from large to small. And then I also plot the corresponding eigenvectors scaled with the eigenvalues. So the eigenvectors are 
um, orthonormal, an orthonormal set of vectors, because it's a symmetric matrix, so they're orthogonal to each other, and they all are constructed to be norm one by this algorithm. And I scale them with the eigenvalue so that we can sort of see where the large and the small bits are. So I run this, and here it is. Why is this so weirdly? Oh, I should. I know I know what the problem is. Um, yeah. uh, this is uh, difficult to get right without looking. Oh, edit. Never try to do live coding what, when, you do, when you can't look at the, at the screen. So that you can see an actual plot. Ah, uh, where's the, okay, second brackets. Okay, now we can see the plot better. So here's what we see. These are the eigenvalues of the session and log base 10 absolute value, and here are the eigenvectors. What do you see? So there's a first observation is, so think, keep in mind that this is log base 10. So we start with a large eigenvalue, which is roughly one actually. And then there's a very rapid decay over the first, I don't know, I should have maybe changed the axis here, maybe the first 50 or so entries, down to 10 to the minus three. And then there's another rapid decay down, down to the 10 to the minus 12, absolutely tiny. And then they are below machine precision for the majority of the eigenvalues. And then what's this bit? What's happening here? So I'm plotting log base 10 of the absolute value of the eigenvalues. Yeah, they are negative eigenvalues. There are negative eigenvalues in this hessian. This thing is just not convex. There's just negative curvature in there. So are we actually at a minimum with SGD? No, it's a settle point. That's just what happens during training. There is a direction that we could still optimize the model in. And it's just sitting there, that's it. So these are the ones that come back up negative. But maybe the good news is they're actually quite small compared to the large ones. So if I would have switched on the grid here, maybe I can do that um, without messing it up. You see that basically those important eigenvalues, they completely dominate over those negative ones. That's also why SGD doesn't, doesn't make use of these because its, it's, its dynamics are completely dominated by those large ones. This is the, the narrow ravine that defines our loss function that pushes SGD to move along. So what we see here maybe is a loss function that looks like this. And then inside, if you would zoom in, if I kind of make a cut out of this, There are, maybe we're currently here, and these are the potential lines. And then there's a hole here somewhere that we're not getting to because it's sort of a weird non-parabolic shape in the loss function. And these are the small eigenvalues that are negative, but SGD does never see those because we're not actually perfectly on the center line of this thing. We're just a little bit off because it's SGD, right? So the gradients are all pointing in these directions, right? SGD is just, with its step size alpha, it's just hopping back and forth over the sides of this loss function, and it never makes it to this endpoint here. OK. Um, and we see the structure and the eigenvalues here, of course, as well. And you can now look at the eigenvectors a bit and see, ah, did they look like? So I've put in these lines again which corresponds to the layer. So the first bit 
is the, this is the, the initial layer, bias of the initial layer. That's the big intermediate layer, the 64 by 64 layer, and then the output again. And what you see here is that the eigenvectors actually have mass, the red bit, across all layers. So there isn't much structure in here um, that relates to the layers. Maybe on the middle bit here, there's a lot of white. So that means in this large inner piece of your memory hasn't really been occupied yet. There's just too much degrees of freedom. And keep in mind that we have 128 training data points. And this thing has over 4,000 parameters. So a lot of these parameters can't possibly be constrained yet. And that's what we see here. They are just, there's just no information about them. OK, so that's our Hessian. And now let's go back to the, to the math slide that says we've now done step three. We've done the eigenvalue decomposition. So we can, in particular, invert this, ma this matrix by just taking the eigenvalues and doing a one over of them. That's cheap now, right? And we're done. Um, and of course, we have to be careful with the eigenvalues that are actually zero. So we'll need to deal with that in a moment. Um, and now we need to linearize to build, this, to build the two objects that will make our Gaussian process. We already have the mean function. It's called network. That's the deep network. And now we need this Laplace tangent kernel. So I'll write this piece of code, show it to you. And here again, annoyingly, the difficult part will be reshaping everything into the right shape. So this Jacobian object, which is, would be nice to write down, it's just one line in JAX, is J, which is a function of the inputs. And it just says, compute the Jacobian of the network function. The network function is the thing that takes the input all the way. It's called f in our slides. With respect to its first input, that's called the parameters. And then return a function that you can evaluate at the input. Now, um, that object, though, because it operates on this network function, it operates on these parameters, which have this shape. And so if it, again, returns an object that is shaped like a function that takes in the inputs and then returns something of this shape. And now we need to make this sort of germane with, these, with, these, uh, with this array. So we have to, again, do the same thing as for the Hessian. But now it's, in a way, only half as complicated because we only need to do it for one entry, right? Because the Jacobian is a derivative with respect to the parameters and not a second derivative with respect to a pair of parameters. So we just do that in this thing. And it's the sort of thing you have to look at afterwards. And because we are going to call it a lot, we're compiling it just in time. No, because we're going to call this function with some input. And in a moment, I'm going to call it with. It's just a, we're just constructing a function, right? And now, uh, oh, somehow, I have a rendering problem with this thing, with this cell. That's not good. Hmm. OK, what happens if I do press reload? Maybe not a good idea. No? OK, so I'll tell you what, what is in here. Um, so we're going to build this, this, this tangent kernel. I should have probably put a cell in here to say that. So we're going to build this object. So we will need to construct a function that takes in two inputs. And then for each input, it constructs this j. And then it multiplies inside with the inverse of psi. Now, keep in mind that we just saw that the, this Hessian has all these pretty much zero eigenvalues and then negative eigenvalues. So if I just naively invert these numbers, I'm going to get lots of infs, 1 over 0, right? Divide by 0 um, outputs. And maybe one reason why this is is that I've set the loss function to have no regularizer. So there is no prior for these weights. And if you have no prior, you don't get meaningful uh, uncertainty. So we have to put in some prior knowledge. And I'll do that by saying maybe I could have used during training a regularizer. I just didn't use it because it wasn't good for SGD. Right? It kind of made SGD not behave well. So now let's say I put in something, a quadratic term, which is um, an, an R of theta that is equal to prior precision. That's the variable that I'm going to use. 
um, times uh, L2 norm theta square. When I do that, that means I'm adding to the Hessian a diagonal matrix, actually a scalar matrix, scaled by prior precision. So our Hessian is actually now psi plus prior precision times 1. And we already have the eigenvalue decomposition of psi. So we know that we can write this as uh, V times E times V transpose. So of course we can write the 1 also as V times 1 times V transpose. So that means the eigenvalues of this combined matrix of this sum are going to be V times E plus P times V transpose, like precisely P plus times 1. So I'm just going to add a number to the eigenvalues to shift them up. And from this plot, I can maybe convince myself that I should probably put something in like, you know, at least 10 to the minus 3, because then I'm going to drown out those negative eigenvalues. So is that good to do or not? Hmm. Now, this is a event where you can think about interpretation. What I'm going to do with this process, I'm going to somehow smooth out this structure in the loss function. It's not going to be visible anymore. It gets blurred away in a way by adding this term. But I will keep the overall shape roughly, depending on how I choose the uh, prior precision. I'm going to start with a pretty large value, 5. That really raises everything up. And we're really just left with these dominating eigenvalues. Um, and now I define this, this tangent kernel. It just takes in A and B, two inputs, and the parameters of the network and the Hessian matrix, um, uh, which is a construction of E and V. Actually, we're not even using, the <laughs> we're not even using it. OK, so that's good. Uh, we could remove this. Then it constructs from the parameters the, the Jacobian for input A and input B. And then this is the line that, stupidly, my browser doesn't show you properly. It does Jacobian of A multiplied with the eigenvectors V. Goes from the left onto here. And also from the right onto the Jacobian of B. And then multiplies inside with 1 over the eigenvalues plus the prior position. So that's the inverse of this matrix to get an approximation to the inverse of the Hessian. Uh, yeah. OK. And um, how did we define the Hessian? Uh, OK. Let's hope that that's right. Maybe play with this a little bit. Um, Hmm, maybe there needs to be an, a minus here, actually. Hmm. Let's see. Well, once we have that, we can define a Gaussian process. Ah, it's annoying that this line doesn't work. Okay, maybe I can just add a, like this. Ah, okay, I should have done this here as well. So, here we go. Um, and this is sort of where the magic happens, if you like. We construct a mean function in a kernel. We already had the mean function. It's just a network evaluated at the trained parameters. And then a kernel, which is this thing evaluated at the trained network and just define our Gaussian process. And at this, this point, we call the piece of Python code that we've been working with for this entire course. It just now constructs this thing. And at this point, we are sort of endowing the network with all of this functionality, with the ability to sample, to instantiate, to train on new data sets, to evaluate log, log uh, PDFs, and so on and so on. And in particular, this means we can make a plot. We can make a plot of the, ah, stupid. Sometimes you just have to live with your, huh? um, we can predict on some plotting grid. And we can plot the uncertainty. And we can also ask our uh, um, Gaussian process posterior to instantiate itself on some, spe some grid and draw posterior samples from this deep neural network. So I will make sure that this actually happens. This takes a bit of time. Why? Because constructing Jacobians actually 
costs a little bit more than constructing forward passes through the network, about five times more. So we have to wait a little bit. So doing this kind of uncertainty can't, doesn't come for free. And now I'm producing a bunch of plots so that we can get to an end. Here you see the posterior mean of this um, function. Here the estimate for the uncertainty. So that's the um, sort of where it's, where it's dark, the network claims to be confident, and where it's white, the network seems to be uncertain. And um, here is this sort of predictive estimate. So that's the approximate prediction for the expected value of the, um, the, the sigmoid transform of the network, assuming that we're Gaussian uncertain about the weights. And you can see that it's a little bit more structured than the mean prediction. And here, down here are three samples, one, two, three, from the posterior. And you see that they sort of adhere to the structure. So they are red where there is red data and green where there is green data, but they are sort of different, right? This could be one hypothesis, this could be one, this could be another one. Um, and I just hope I didn't have a minus wrong here. Let me just run this code once to see what happens if we put in a minus here. So that I, I would, oops, not a minus. Huh? No, I don't know my own. What the? Okay. Because there are negative eigenvalues, so let's hope it's not wrong. Um, I get an error? No. Huh. Hmm. Okay. So maybe we're mostly seeing the large eigenvalues at this point. Ah. So what one might like to do now is realize that. The expensive computation is actually j times v, multiplying the, constructing the Jacobian and multiplying it with v. So if you want to play around with different prior positions, p, you can just pre-compute that object. You can look at the code later if you want. And then um, you can sort of do a sweep through these um, different values of the precisions and just check what the, what the samples would look like. And so you can see that for, for large precisions, if you could just lift out all the small eigenvalues, you just get the mean prediction back pretty much because therefore it's just confident about everything. And for small precisions, you get all sorts of unstructured uh, estimates. Question. Uh, just because I've chosen the prior position to be larger than the negative eigenvalues. So the, in this plot, We've seen that this, the, this, the largest, in absolute terms, negative eigenvalues are at 10 to the minus 3 or so. And what I'm adding here is always larger than 10 to the minus 3. Yeah? Uh, it's lot, it seems like our model is not doing that very well. Yeah. So there's a lot of things to see in this plot. Maybe let's spend two minutes to think about some of these, these structures. So the first thing is maybe you see a lot of structure in this in this um, uncertainty plot. And what these are is they are sort of reflective of where the eigenvalues actually lie. And you can see in here maybe the shape of these VLU features that lie in this space. They, they provide these harsh straight lines. That's because they, there's, there's, a, there's a feature in there with a relatively large weight that has some uncertainty to it that just kind of get reflected. Um, another thing that you see is that we also get kind of structured uncertainty. So we're sort of highly certain in this sort of region down here, and very uncertain, of course, along the decision boundary. But there's also a large part of uncertainty, for example, over here, a lot of structure in this, on those parts. And we see this in the samples that here, this, the, actually down here maybe as well, the network up there flops around a lot. So in the bottom right, it's relatively confident, but in the um, sort of up here and up here, there's a lot of flexibility. And now we can think about why this actually is and why do we have to put in this prior precision. So this is maybe the last point I want to make it's very, because it's very important. You could get now the impression that maybe some of you will write this in the feedback in a, in a moment. I can anticipate that if this is all so you know, wishy-washy and lots of samples and it all looks very different, why should I trust this Laplace approximation? This seems like a really sort of made-up thing to do. But 
the important thing to, mem to remember now here is that we're standing on top of this pile of auto diff already. So if this doesn't look the way you expected it to look, your first thought should maybe not be the Laplace approximation being wrong, but the fact that you're dealing with this deep neural network, which is really complicated to work with. So for example, keep in mind that we here have something like just over 4,000 parameters being fitted onto 128 data points. So of course this model is uncertain in all sorts of crazy ways because there is no near, near enough information in a data set to train this thing. But that's a typical setting in deep learning. People over-parameterize their networks. So if you want to make these plots look better, the first thing is not to break away from Laplace approximations, but to go back up in this Jupyter notebook and drastically reduce the size of the network. And I can tell you, there's no time to do it now, but you can try it yourself. You can actually train this network to 100% accuracy with 10% of the weights. Maybe even 1% if you do it right. Even a single layer neural network is going to work well on this, right? And when you do that, you'll find that a lot of this complicated structure which you saw with negative eigenvalues, and all, it's just going to go away. And then maybe you can take that as sort of a thing, something to think about, whether you actually have to build your deep neural network so, so in such a big, complicated way. The other thing you might think is, huh, this all seemed really complicated. Remember on Monday, I just clicked SGD, and it just worked, right? It went down, and I somehow had to tune the parameters a little bit. And now we had to do all this complicated work to construct this, and then, you know, I even made some mistakes in the code, and it's like, eh, this is actually all right. So is this too expensive to do? Is it too elaborate? So on the coding side, hopefully, in a few years, this will become much more natural to do because the stack will adapt and people will write code to make this automatic for you. But the other thing is, is it actually more expensive? Well, here, for the purposes of this lecture, I constructed this entire Hessian, which is this big thing. And computing it is cubically expensive in this number 4,000 whatever number of parameters. But if you look at this plot, it's clear that we really only need this bit we really only need this part where the line is large, right? Where the eigenvalues are large. These, con these contain the entire geometric information about the loss function. And then everything underneath is just tiny bits of detail that we can look at and we can have nice little arguments about, but they don't have any effect on the network, actually. So if you want to make this code fast, you have to think about ways of only computing that first bit, that tiny little bit. And then afterwards, of course, predicting is going to be so much faster because we don't need a Jacobian with respect to the entire weights, but only with respect to this linear projection of like, I don't know, 50 parts of the weight space, actually. And you might think about what else this tells you about your network. Maybe you don't even need the entire weight space. You only need a linear projection onto those 50 dimensions. That's much easier to store as well. This really is a map of your memory. So we will talk more about this on um, uh, next Monday, where I'll keep like, pointing out a few more aspects of these Laplace approximations, what I've shown you today is a way to turn any deep neural network into a Gaussian process. So now hopefully it becomes clear why we spent eight or nine lectures talking about Gaussian process models, because now we've just sort of plucked all this functionality on top of the uh, deep neural networks that you've learned about in social media and other lectures. This only involves auto diff and linear algebra. Both of these are non-trivial. They amount to complicated code, but they are not like nasty in the fiddly kind of way. They are just like hard pieces of numerical code that can be treated, that can be designed well and tuned well and understood well. Of course, we have to be careful to make them work for larger networks, but that's something we can talk about in another lecture. I hope some of you give feedback, and I'm looking forward to see you on Monday. Thank you very much.